eight different head units over eight days. Today, I'm gonna to cover my usage and user experience with a lot of head units over a lot of kilometers. For the recent Festive 500 challenge over on Strava, where we have to ride 500 kilometers in the last eight days of the year, I took the opportunity to use a different head unit, bike computer, or GPS, however you categorize these, for every single ride that I did. Now there's a few units here that I haven't covered in depth, so I thought this would be an opportunity to spend more time with these units to get my head around the ins and outs and the pros and cons of each. The units that I used and the units I'm talking about in today's video include the Wahoo Element Roam, the Garmin Edge 830, the Hammerhead Karoo, the Sigma Rocks 12, the Pioneer CA600, the Garmin Edge 130, the Garmin Edge 1030, and the Brighton Rider 420. Riding with each of these units involved just standard usage. So turning them on, putting them on the front of the bike, pairing my sensors and going. So what I would call standard usage and keeping an eye on the kilometers because if it wasn't on Strava, it didn't count for the Festive 500 and that's the most important part. It's all about the distance. I wasn't using any navigation or routing. I was using just the visual maps if the unit had them. Almost using the default configuration as well. I didn't spend too much time changing the defaults. So it was, a lot of these were out of the box on the front of the bike and go. The sensors that I had on the bike were paired if they were compatible with these units. So that included heart rate, power, DI2 or ETAP axis and the Varia radar. So if they were supported by any of these, that's what I paired up and rode with. And the key feature there being distance. As I said, if they didn't record the distance, these things were dead to me. So today's not an in-depth review of any of the units, just more of a general usage and observations over two to three hours. All units have been updated to the latest firmware as of the date that I was using, so between uh, December 24th, 2019 and December 31st, 2019. So before I get into a brief overview on each of these eight units, I do need to acknowledge we're looking at different levels of GPS head units, bike computers today. There are some fully featured units, there's some mid-range, and there's some budget level units. So comparing them all together could be a little troublesome, but comparing what claims to be a fully featured to another fully featured unit, you might see they don't quite stack up. Okay, with eight units to get through, let's start off with the Wahoo Element Roam day one. And I'm very familiar with this unit. I have done a full review, which I'll link to below. It can be used as a daily driver for what I do, not a problem at all. It has frequent updates pushed from Wahoo, very readable screen, pretty good maps, nice and colorful. DI2 DFly support, plus records DI2 gear change events, radar support, smart notifications so you get calls and messages over Bluetooth when you're out and about. There is live tracking for this via that Bluetooth connectivity. It has Wi-Fi at home to download updates. Oh, radar disconnected, that's also downstairs at the moment. Uh, you can download updates via Wi-Fi at home that makes things easy. It has its almost Garmin compatible mount on the back, which you can convert to a Garmin mount with a little adapter from Wahoo. Easy as that and it becomes Garmin compatible. And it's Wahoo's premium cycling GPS head unit. So nothing really to write home about on that one. Again, my reviews of this below, I've covered this quite extensively on the channel. There we are, the Wahoo Element Roam. Day two, the Garmin Edge 830, another daily driver that I use in the Llama Lab and around. The touch screen on the 830 is 100% better than on the 820, if you're familiar with that touch screen. Again, it's a Garmin device, so it supports everything. You've got DI2, Cycling Dynamics, Ant Plus Radar, Cycling IQ apps, frequent updates. If you're a watcher of the channel, you see I cover quite a few of the updates getting pushed to these units. Smart notifications over Bluetooth when you're out in the field. Live tracking via that Bluetooth connection if you need be. It has to be said that Garmin really do set the benchmark for being fully featured on their head units. They even have the Connect IQ app store where you can load custom apps on this unit or even your watch. That's pretty cool. I understand Garmin isn't for everyone, but in 2019, they did come out with a lot of enhancements that addressed a lot of the issues people were having with previous units. There we go, the Garmin Edge 830. On to day three and unit number three, and things get interesting, the Hammerhead Karoo. Now I've split this one into pros and cons to make it easy. Now the pros of the Hammerhead Karoo, the screen, it is brilliant, it is bright, it is colorful, it is absolutely wonderful. And the touch screen performance, single touch and multi-touch is absolutely hands down the best in the market. It's what I'd call iPhone fast. And because of the brilliant screen and navigation with your finger, uh, it has some pretty good routing and mapping on here. So to use that out in the field, that was brilliant. It even had some single trail out when we did the gravel ride with this the other day. The Karoo uses a Garmin compatible mount on the back, which makes things easy. 
and it's actually an Android phone underneath. So you can sideload apps unofficially and have other things running on here at the same time. So I have loaded on here a few other apps such as the Zwift companion app, which does run on here, and also a version of Doom also runs on here. I've downloaded the Chrome browser and I have been surfing the web on this thing because the screen is so good. There are regular updates pushed to this unit every two weeks or so, so there's been quite a few significant updates since I've had this unit in hand, which has been good to see. They're the pros. Now onto the cons, and there's no getting around the fact this thing is huge. It is massive, it is heavy. It's around 190 grams, which smashes all these to pieces in the weight side of things. Uh, and Bezelville, there's quite a lot of unused space around the outside of this. Another showstopper for me with the Hammerhead crew is there's no speaker, there's no beeper, this thing is mute. If you're using turn-by-turn -turn nav or the Ant Plus radar, which it does support, you get nothing, you can't hear it, you have to be looking at the device. That is a showstopper, this thing needs a beeper. It also mashes all the sensors into one single ID, which really screws things up for me when I'm using the data from this for my data analysis. Um, you need sensor IDs as individual things so you can track those. This just mashes them all into one and calls it a sensor. I really don't like how it does that. It does have DI2 and ETAP support, but it's also a cosmetic integration. What I mean by that is that it supports the buttons on your handlebars to change screens. It'll show the gearing information on screen, but it doesn't record that to the fit file. Another downside is there's no Bluetooth data connectivity for the Hammerhead Karoo. So when you're out in the field, you need Wi-Fi connectivity, which is not really gonna happen when you're out on the bike in the middle of nowhere, or a SIM card with data access. Again, it's an Android phone, so you can put a SIM card in there. However, we are mostly riding around with uh, data connections on our phones, in our back pockets, that thing could be using. Again, another showstopper, you're not gonna get calls, alerts, any status notifications externally to this unit without that data connection. And it doesn't have that Bluetooth data connection, so that's another downside for that unit. So in short, for the Karoo, the screen, best in class, but there are quite a few things that just really aren't up to standard just yet with the Hammerhead crew when you're comparing it to something like the Garmin Edge or the Wahoo Element offerings. What this needs, first of all, a speaker. The second thing, it needs a speak. This has to have a speaker. Showstopper, has to have a speaker. That's no question about that. It needs a diet, it's extremely weighty, and a Bluetooth data connectivity as an option. It's not critical, but it's nice to have. You're gonna get alerts on screen, you're gonna be able to send uh, your live track information if you have that. People have that connectivity. Not a lot of people have SIM cards or Wi-Fi when they're out riding. A few things that could just polish this off to make it a better unit. Halfway there and day four, the Sigma Rocks 12 unit. This is another large unit in size, not so much weight, weighing it around 125 grams. This is though the tallest unit that I have. It's quite a phablet in this direction here. It is a touch screen. There are very infrequent updates to this unit. The last update was over six months ago in July 2019. There's also no Bluetooth data connection for this unit. So you're not gonna get status notifications, updates, etc. out in the field when you're riding this. It does have Wi-Fi for uploads when you're at home or home base, and also micro USB to do updates and things, but that's one thing that's quite lacking in this device. There's also no Ant Plus radar support, so when riding with this, I had to have another unit on there alerting with the beeps, which I like to have with the Ant Plus radar. It does have DOI2 support, so you have D-Fly buttons and on-screen gearing information. Doesn't record that information though. So again, a cosmetic implementation of DI2 or electronic gearing. Sigma have a weird combination of applications and utilities for this. There's the data center, Sigma Link, and Sigma Cloud. I really can't figure out what the three do. It's a little confusing with that. As a comparison, Garmin have Garmin Connect. You load the Garmin Connect app on your phone. You go to the Garmin Connect website, the branding, the experience is all unified. This is a little disjointed. The map management on this unit is also a little confusing. When you go into the maps and see what's installed, it says there's no maps installed, but there actually is maps installed on the unit. So the map management is a little weird on the Sigma Rocks 12. The on-screen maps are good and navigatable, and the touchscreen performance is also what I'd call good. Look, when this first came out, probably 18 months ago, the touchscreen performance as compared to the units out then would have been excellent. People, I'm sure, would have been claiming this has probably has the best touchscreen. It's been surpassed though. The 830, the Karoo, a few other things have really taken over. It feels a little laggy. It's good, better than the 820. Touchscreen though, again, as I said, it's been overtaken by other things. Next up, there's a lot of bezel on this unit. You may be able to see it on screen here. It's probably better if I turn to the back there. You've got the black section through here and the gray section. That black section there is larger than the screen. 
So if I flip that over, it's they've done a bit of trickery here with the um, the bezels and the buttons and things. However, that is more surface area than the screen. So being one of the tallest units out there, it really needs to be trimmed down in that aspect. And to call out something very weird on this unit, uh, it was rattling on the bike and I could not for a number of kilometers figure out what was rattling and what was causing it. Turns out this little button here on the front when it's cold, it rattles a little bit. You probably can't really pick that up in the mic. Hopefully that's coming through a little bit. But as I'm riding along on a cold, it was rattling on the front of my bike until I touched that button and it went away. Whether it's just this unit or not, I don't know, but it did my head in what it was all about. Um, I've shaken all these other units. They don't rattle. This one was rattling a little bit. So I call that the bit of a rattlesnake bug with that. Um, look, in short, there's no real standout feature for the ROX 12 that I can really sing about. Look, it works. Is it a daily driver? No, not really. And the thing is massive. What this unit needs, uh, obviously Bluetooth data connectivity while well, you're out riding for alerts, notifications, maybe some life track in the future, and plus radar support, please. To record the DI2 electronic gear change events, it has them on screen. It wouldn't take much just to add them to the fit file so we can track that uh, information if we choose to do so. The unification of the app, so data center, Sigma Link, and Sigma Cloud, get those as Sigma something or other and just make the user experience a little bit more seamless there. And obviously a form factor rethink. That being bigger, it needs to be trimmed down. On to day five and another lesser known unit, the Pioneer CA600. It is a code name device and as you'd expect, a bit of a scientific device, this one. So lots of advanced metrics. This one pairs with the Pioneer power meter and the unit is designed to match up with that power meter in the pedal monitoring mode. So it has all the advanced power monitor metrics on that. Uh, although the Wahoo units also now support the recording of those metrics. Color screen, non-touch screen though. It's a very compact screen, but there's still a lot of bezel around it. It looks a lot like the Sigma Rocks, if you can get a look on those two there. Very similar design for the screen layout. One thing I had trouble with this unit was the size of the screen and the data fields. When it's out here on the bike and it's shaking around, it can be hard to read exactly what data field you're looking at. I guess over time when you're familiar with what screens you've set up, you can glance down and glance back up, but it can be a little troublesome when things are shaking around to know exactly what you're looking at there. Probably more of an indoor cycling device where you can bury your head, put your nose right on it, have a look at your stats from the pedal monitor mode and get your ride on indoors. Kind of defeats the purpose of being a GPS though. There is even one screen that has 15 data fields. Now, that's not something you can just glance at and see what's going on, but 15 data fields on such a small form factor can be troublesome. There is DI2 support, which appears to record the gear changes. However, di2stats.com was unable to parse that information and make any use of it. So I'm not quite sure what format they're recording those gear change events in. No Ant Plus radar support. Ah, needs to have that. The maps are good, but no touch screen and such a small screen means it's quite limited to what you can get out of it out on the road. Uh, there are smart notifications though via Bluetooth data link, which is also handy. What this unit needs is one, a larger screen and a more general user focused interface and experience. It feels a little scientific, which may be for some, but not for the majority, I don't think. Um, it also has a Wahoo sort of not Garmin compatible mount, which again, this little do flicky works just well to make it a Garmin compatible mount. So a few similarities there with the bolt too, even with the button layout. Hmm, interesting. Okay, the CA600 from Pioneer. On to day six and something that really did put a smile on my face, this little baby Garmin here, the Edge 130. It is tiny. So this unit, not a fully fledged Edge unit such as the 530, the 830 or the 1030. It has a subset of features from those units. It has a slightly different user interface. However, getting my head and fingers around that wasn't a problem at all. There's no DI2 integration. There's no left, right power data, but you do get total power on this. So this does support power meter recording. It also supports Ant Plus Radar, which puts a smile on my dial. That is awesome. There's no mapping, but there is breadcrumb trails and basic routing off that. It does have an altimeter, so you do get the elevation profile on screen as you're riding along. And it has Garmin Connect IQ fields. So if there's something missing from here and it's in the Garmin Connect IQ store, you can download that, put the field on the screen, and away you go. That's pretty cool. Battery life on this thing is claimed to be 15 hours. The reports though out in the field aren't really 15 hours. So I jumped over to the Garmin forums and here's the table of battery life, what we can expect out of this little baby here. So with GPS, with no sensors, up to 15 hours usage. Onto high usage at the bottom there, which is GLONASS, GPS, four sensors, including power. Following a course, you can expect 10 hours out of this unit. 
I'd even add adding radar beeping to this. You probably get eight to nine hours usage out of this. But look, that's not too bad at all for such a compact little design. With this, you get the Garmin ecosystem. So you get Physio True Up if you're doing rides, runs, swims, and multiple devices, it will sync all of those. You get Garmin Connect, you get Live Track, you get smart notifications. Look, this thing here is now my go to backup GPS. It's cute, it's small, it just works. And uh, yeah, that's a big win. I'd put this in the budget category, not quite a budget price tag though, it's sort of medium range. But again, this, this was a surprise packet. I really did enjoy my time with that. My list here of what this needs was a little hard for this one because anything they add to the 130, it's really gonna creep into the 530 market. So there is a reason why they've kept it kind of lightweight, so to speak. Uh, maybe a slightly better battery life would be handy on the 130. Almost under the home stretch now, day seven, and I use the Garmin Edge 1030. Not a new unit, it's getting on in years. However, there's been a few updates to this recently to bring it up to spec somewhat to the 530 and the 830 feature sets. It supports, well, pretty much everything. It's a fully featured Garmin Edge, so you get radar support, all your sensors, DI2, full power metrics, recording, left, right, cycling dynamics, great maps and routing. You can put customized maps or third-party maps on here. The touchscreen performance is good. Again, it's been surpassed by the 830 and obviously the Hammerhead Karoo, so it's not too bad. It's definitely better than the old 820. One thing that was obvious with the screen on this, it feels a little washed out compared to the newer, brighter, vibrant screens. So that was a little disappointing going back to this unit, which I did love, and it feeling just a little washed out out in the sun. No need for me to cover all the details of this unit. I've covered a few other edge units here, and it's similar for this one. Fully featured, works with everything, supports the standards, which is super important. What this unit needs? Well, uh, it's a nice unit, but a processor upgrade. I think it's due for one of those. It just feels a little laggy in general use and a more vibrant screen. So the Edge 1030, you still see a lot of those out in the field. And finally, day eight, getting me across the line of the Festi 500, the Brighton 420 unit. Now, a more refined unit from Brighton than the 450 that I looked at a few months back. Uh, the unit is without mapping and is without Wi-Fi, so it's more of a budget level unit, coming in at around $130 US. The Rider 420 comes with a Garmin compatible mount on the back, so no mucking about with adapters. This thing goes straight on the front of the bike if you've got a Garmin unit already, and away you go. It's not a touchscreen unit, which means setting up the data fields can be a little troublesome. However, the app configurator is really, really cool. Probably one of the best I've seen and one of the easiest. I think every configuration option I saw on the head could be configured within their app. So this was up and running out of the box in under 10 minutes for me, for what I needed. One of the downsides, I guess, of the Brighton unit is the screen resolution. It looks a lot like a Casio watch from the early 90s. But having said that, it's no longer inset, so there's no shadow casting. It's nice and bright and vibrant to read out in the road, but the font sizing and the general layout is a little outdated. This unit does have the Bluetooth data link, so you do get smart notifications out on the road, which I put more value on than having Wi-Fi. Um, claim battery life of 35 hours on this Brighton, which even half of that is pretty much the industry standard for everything else here. So battery life is also a big plus for the Brighton units. What this needs, well, obviously a high resolution screen. Monochrome is still okay. That works for mainly what we need, but they just need to ditch that old Casio look. Also a little more polished to the app and the web user interface. It feels a little basic, but it gets things done. Again, that's from the budget level, probably the cheapest unit that I'm looking at here today, but it did the job. So there it is, the eight units that I used this week and some brief observations on the user experience of each. And in summary, they all worked. They recorded the distance and time and uploaded to Strava. I got my Festi 500 done. I think it's fair to say GPS is a solved problem across the board. I had no issues with accuracy, distance, there were no crashes, GPS related um, or otherwise. So everything was okay there. That's a certain standard that has been met with all of these units. Okay, to compress this video down into my takeouts for the week after 500Ks with all the different hardware, first up the Hammerhead Karoo. That screen, that touchscreen performance, hands down, best in field. That was absolutely brilliant few things this thing lets me down in, in other areas, but that touch screen, that's the new standard. Absolutely brilliant. Second up is the little baby Garmin. This thing is so cute, but it works, and it works very, very well. That's now my go-to backup unit. I'll always have this one charged, and possibly in the back pocket if I ever need to record some data from a power meter and out my rides. This thing is super cute, super cool. I'm sure Rides of Japan should be running one of these. It is super light too. And lastly, the Brighton Rider 420 budget unit that just worked out of the box in under 10 minutes. Look, it does have that screen resolution issue looking like a Casio watch, but it does just work. 
If you want to steer clear of all the other devices here, cheaper unit with a claimed massive battery life, there's an option right there, the 420. And wrapping up the feature sets that I need across the board, that would be sound. I'm looking at you, Hammerhead, you need a beeper, you need a speaker. Uh, Bluetooth phone connectivity for all. Yeah, it's nice to have a SIM card in one of these or a Wi-Fi connectivity, but out on the road, nearly every one of us has a phone with Bluetooth and a data connection. Make use of it. DI2, ETAP and electronic group set support, again, is a must have simply for the battery is low error that comes up on the screen. D5 buttons are handy, having the data recorded is handy, but riding along knowing your DI2 is going to go flat in a few minutes, that's very, very valuable information. And without DI2 support, you're never gonna know. Your gear changes just aren't gonna work. It goes without saying, especially here on the GP Llama channel, Varia radar support or AMP plus radar support more accurately across the board on all of these. We want beeps, we want radar support. It's a must have for all of these units. As well as sticking to standards when recording fit file data. Makes things a lot easier for analysis. So there we have it, my summary, my review, my few hours with each of these units over the Festi 500. As I've said, they worked, of course. But do they work to my liking? Yeah, some of them did, some of them didn't. Some of them had really great features. Some of them were very, very small. Did I mention that's a pretty cool little unit? Anyhow, there we are. If you're in the market for a unit looking to change, looking to switch, or looking to learn a little bit more about each of those, hopefully this one's been informative. If so, hit that like button and also hit that subscribe button to be alerted of new videos being uploaded here to the GP Llama YouTube channel. And while you're there, hit that join button to become an inside member of this channel. Alrighty, thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.